All right. So um, the second half of the morning, um, I am uh, honored and thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Sandy Chung. Um, many of you know Sandy Chung locally um, uh, from her role as a pediatrician in trusted pediatrics and her work with the Virginia chapter, the AAP. Um, and Sandy is now um, finishing her, um, her uh, year's term as president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And uh, I just want to observe that um, uh, how extraordinary it is to even have one president here, but we actually have two presidents here, uh, Dr. Lee Beers, who was president uh, two years before or three years before. It all, it's all a blur or whatever, but um, um, it's really extraordinary to have that kind of connection um, with uh, national leadership right here in our own backyard, uh, because it means that their advocacy at the national level is actually informed and in um with uh, who we are right here as pediatricians in this particular um, neighborhood community. Um, and uh, with that, I, um, I had invited Sandy to present from her role as sort of finishing up her year as president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and at the same time, I uh, was spending a fair amount of time searching for someone who could begin to speak a little bit knowingly about artificial intelligence and its potential impact not just globally, but what's that going to mean for pediatricians? And quite frankly, uh, I couldn't really find a good speaker and totally forgot that uh, Sandy is also um, um, quite accomplished and knowledgeable in the informatics space and is a champion there as well. And Sandy said, oh, yeah, I could talk a little bit about that as well. So the good news is not only do we get Dr. Sandy Chung, but we get a twofer. You know, we actually get uh, some AAP perspective as well as some perspective on artificial intelligence. So I am thrilled to introduce my uh, friend and uh, colleague, um, Dr. Sandy Chung. Thank you, Mark. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, fantastic. It's so fun to be here because I know so many of you, and, and those of you who I don't know, hopefully I'll get to know over the years. It's been amazing this year to have been president of the AAP, so I'm honored to share this moment with you um, where, where I'm ending my term and the end of this year and then begin my let my term as immediate past president. This morning, somebody asked me if I was done at, you know, at the end of the year, and I said, oh, I think I become past president for the rest of my life, and, and, and that is true. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I don't have anything to disclose. So there's a game we play at my um, practice, but also in my house, um, and it's called Where in the World is Your AAP President? Um, for them, it's Where in the World is Mom? Um, but it's, you know, I just thought I'd talk you through a little bit of my journey here. So it started back at NCE of 2022. And at NCE, that's our big annual meeting. That's when you kind of realize what you just signed up for and how big this is. Um, so that's when I started and the AAP headquarters is in Illinois. So I was in Chicago, right outside Chicago and I task at Illinois quite a bit. And then at home. One of the very first things that I got to do as AAP president is to give a talk um, to the Ukrainian pediatricians. Um, that was virtual, as you can imagine. And so what an incredible honor to be able to speak to pediatricians all around the world, to be able to chat with them and uh, help them understand, you know, that as pediatricians, we're all working together to take care of kids and that we're here to support each other. Um, it was virtual, so this is my home studio. And so if you've ever seen me talk, you may have recognized that background. Then back to the United States, and then through the US, I was able to travel quite a bit, get to speak to pediatricians all throughout the country, giving grand rounds. I uh, was able to go to Puerto Rico to talk to some pediatricians there. And I think the message is that what I recognize, and I know from working with all of you, that we're all struggling with some of the same things, 
we all celebrate some of the same things, and that all of us have children at the core of what we do. And so, and I, and I really was able to see that this year, especially being able to travel the world. We went to India, and in India, that was the meeting of the International Pediatric Association. That's where representatives from pediatric societies from over 120 countries gather, and we talk about what's happening in our countries. And again, one of the interesting things is how much across the world we're very similar. We all just went through a global pandemic. So we all went through the same issues and we all went through some of the same struggles. Everyone is differently resourced, of course, in different countries. Um, I remember talking to a um, pediatric hematology oncology doctor from uh, Tanzania and he was saying that he was the only pediatric hemonc doctor for his entire country. And he trained somebody and then there were two and one of their challenges was that they had a particularly large sickle cell population and um, every day thousands of people would come up to their clinic in order to be seen. And so they saw 800 patients a day, the two of them. So how do you do that even, right? Very, that's very, very, very impossible to imagine. But they had a team, you know, so they had staff, they had nurses, were people who worked as nurses who would do a lot of the work, and they were there basically to, to see the super complex kids. But just thinking about the different places that um, where children are being seen in this country and being cared for, I mean, in this world and being cared for, talked to another group of pediatricians in Indonesia. And these Indonesian pediatricians, I was asking them, you know, are you experiencing a workforce shortage? Because certainly in the United States we are. And they said, oh, no. We're not. I'm like, oh, wow, if you're not, why? And it turns out that for the millions of children that are in Indonesia, there are only 4,000 pediatricians in total. And so in Indonesia, it's, a, it's made up of many, many, many islands. And so they essentially you know, are used to a workforce shortage. It's sort of a permanent condition for them. Um, at the same time, traveling to other countries, I was able to chat about workforce because that is truly a problem, especially after a pandemic. Um, next, back to the US. So really, again, having that opportunity to see what's happening in our own country. And in our own country, there's quite a bit of variability, as you can imagine. Even within our context of the DMV, there are differences between our different states and district. And so we, and I have a very small microcosm of that here ourselves, but was able to explore that across the country and talk to pediatricians. Then off to Japan. And so with Japan, um, so I don't know if you all knew you were just gonna get a photo album today and a review of my trips, but, but you are. So. Um, so went to Japan, Japanese Pediatric Society invites the AAP every year to speak. And so I did a talk on youth mental health. And what was interesting in my talk, I referenced gun violence. And when I talked about gun violence, one of the, the, the pediatricians stood up at the, one of the pediatricians stood up at the end and they said, you know, we don't have guns here. So what else can we think about? I was like, oh, I'm gonna move here. Um, but you know, just really interesting. However, suicide is the leading, second leading cause of death in our country for kids aged 10 to 24. In Japan, it's the number one cause. So mental health is an issue across the world. So we were able to share ideas. Then off to Argentina. And so in Argentina, what was interesting is that I talked to pediatricians there about workforce and what, what do you suppose their primary concern was? Any thoughts? It was actually payment. So payment was their number one issue for their pediatricians in their country. They have national health care, but the undervaluation of pediatrics in their national health care system is significant. And so they actually had pediatricians um, protesting and on strike and, and all sorts of things happening in their country in order to be able to provide enough, get enough people to go into the field and also to preserve the existing workforce. So payment's an issue across the world. And then back to the US. So through the US, you know, able to travel and go to different places, going up to Canada, going to Mexico, et cetera, um, really got to see a lot. Uh, I have, I think, 300,000 frequent flyer miles from this year, to give you an idea. And so happy I was able to be here this week. So 
it sounds pretty amazing being able to travel the world and all this all across the country to see so many places and it was amazing I, I will save that for sure however when you go and you travel and you go to conferences and you go to grand rounds what you actually see a lot of is this conference rooms hotels so this is a view out of one of my hotel windows and so I just wanted to give you a tour of what I actually saw during my trip. <laughs> so these are views from all my different hotel rooms. Sometimes the weather was good. Sometimes the weather wasn't good. Sometimes the views were pretty great. Uh, some were even better. That was Puerto Rico. But there's one view out of one hotel room window that I absolutely adore, and that one's this. This is the AAP headquarters in Itasca, Illinois. So whenever I'm there and being able to see this, it reminds me of why I'm doing what I'm doing and why we all do what we do. In order to take the best care of kids, we work together, we support each other. This conference is an amazing example of that. When one of the leaders at AAP headquarters heard I was coming to the Business of Pediatrics conference, he said, wow, that's super unusual. That must be the first time they're doing this. And I said, oh no, they're way ahead of the game. This is their 26th time. And he said, wow, that's incredible. When I started this year, there were three concepts that I put in place um, to really frame my, my presidency year, and it was these, and you may have seen them before. So reframe, reimagine, and rejuvenate. Reframing, because as we go th have gone through the world and the, the pandemic, things have changed. So we have had to reframe some of the stuff that's happening in the news and stuff that's happening in our landscape. Reimagine because the world has continued to change and how do we reimagine how we deliver care differently and rejuvenating to remember why we do what we do. AAP every year sets strategic priorities and so you can see them here. And so throughout this year, we've been working on a lot of things, um, but these are four that we focused on. And so COVID-19 and disaster recoveredness, disaster recovery, uh, I'm sorry, and equity, diversity and inclusion, healthy mental and emotional development, and then safety and well-being within the pediatric profession. The board every year meets to determine what these are going to be, and so you will be one of the first people to see what it, they are for 2024. So we meet in September after our leadership conference, and we gather data from everywhere on what needs to be uh, focused on. And so these are the ones for 2024. And so you can see we've changed one. The one that was said COVID-19 and disaster recovery, we have now changed it to environmental health and disaster readiness. Climate change, as we all know, we have certainly seen examples of how it has impacted us as everywhere, really. Um, and we know as particularly children are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So adding that to our initiatives, we also changed it from priorities to initiatives. That's important because a lot of what we do at AAP is a priority, even if it's not on this list. So Medicaid unwinding. Who's heard of Medicaid unwinding? Yeah, so Medicaid unwinding, what's happening there? So Medicaid actually covers over half of the children in the United States. So in August, 55% of our country's children were covered by Medicaid. If you wanna think about that in a different way, over half of the children in this country are near the poverty line. So that's a lot. The other thing that happened is that over the pandemic, when you qualified for Medicaid, states were not allowed to disenroll or take people off the roster even if their circumstances change, and that was throughout the public health emergency. In April of this past year, Congress decided it was okay for states to now go through their rosters and start to check their rosters to see if people still qualified. So that meant that if now you no longer qualified that you'd be taken off of Medicaid and not re-enrolled. So one can imagine that if it's a program that covers 55% of the United States' children, what that might look like. So we thought about it a lot, we all could kind of see the good and the bads and the uglies, all of the things. Um, and then here we are many months later and uh, things are concerning. First, let's sort of set the landscape because this is before the unwinding. So in 2022, the percentage of children, when we look at who's uninsured in this country, who are they represent, who do they represent? And you can see um, the Hispanic children represent 8.6%, um, black children, Asian children, white. And then you can look at it by geography. Then you can also look at it by states. Um, and it's not the percent of unenrolled, but how many of their children are un uninsured. So, um, so for example, the first 
one for Hispanic children, um, 8.6 of Hispanic children are uninsured. So we've started unwinding, and this is what's happened so far. Two million children in this country have lost Medicaid. Two million children now may not have insurance, now may not have access to care. So that's the problem. It's not the same across the country in every state. You can see that the states that are darker colored have more children who are, have been unenrolled off of Medicaid. Now the colors here aren't surprising, just given the numbers of children in their state that are on Medicaid. So certainly in Texas, for example, they have more kids that are on Medicaid. So having more that have been disenrolled is not terribly surprising. However, one of the concerns is why they were disenrolled. So many, many of the children, one in four of the children, have been disenrolled because nobody could reach them or they couldn't fill out the paperwork or they didn't fill out the paperwork. And so now we have kids that qualify for Medicaid that suddenly are not being covered. This may be happening in your practices. So if you are finding out that a child is no longer eligible for Medicaid, it may be helpful to do a little research to figure out why. Is it truly that they no longer qualify or is it just that their families didn't know what to do to re-enroll? So why is this happening? Well, Medicaid is different in every single state. So we live in the borders of the states and the, the districts, so we know that. Um, but every state, even though it's somewhat federally funded, it's also state funded and state administered. So you have tremendous variability state to state. We actually have 56 plus programs because the territories also have their own Medicaids. Here you can look at payment. So this is the state compared Medicaid to Medicare rates. The darker the color of the state, the, more they, the closer they are to Medicare rates. And then the lighter the color, the lower their rates are compared to Medicare. I was talking to some pediatricians in Puerto Rico, and they were telling me how in their state, for a 99213, they were getting $28. So you, you can imagine how hard it must be to run a practice when that's happening. So that's the problem. So as, a, as an academy, we're certainly starting to really need to work on this as because as in, from a national perspective, we have that opportunity. I've shown this one before, but really pediatrics is an investment in our future. And so we know as pediatricians, as those who work in pediatric practices, when we invest in kids early, the return on investment is huge, but it's also over 20 to 30 to 40 years. Pediatricians are not the highest earners compared to our adult medicine colleagues. I follow this graph pretty much every year. We're usually at the bottom or near the bottom. Psychiatry used to be below us. Now they're a little bit higher. Um, public health is below us this year. But it's not really just about making more money. That's not the key at all. It's actually being able to provide the resources. When we're trying to tackle mental health issues, when we're trying to help social determinants of health, when we're trying to implement new vaccines and, and things, we need that funding in order to be able to survive. And so that payment issue is super important. For the states that provide data, we actually know that over 10% of kids in this country don't have regular access to medical care. And so as pediatricians, we want to meet that need, but in order to do that, we need to be paid appropriately. I like to garden. Anybody here like to garden? Some people. So for those of you who don't garden, I think you probably get the concept. You know, when you plant a seed, you need to take care of it. Water, light, all of those things, making sure that you're, they're in a good place that's comfortable, but also making sure they get the nutrients that they need to survive. And then if you nurture them over time, eventually they become a full grown plant. And then eventually you have a garden. But if you take care of a garden and you only take care of the fully grown plants and you don't pay any attention to the seedlings and the new plants, very soon you won't have a garden at all. And so in pediatrics, the work that we do is this. We ensure that the future of our country is going to be fine and that there will be enough people, healthy people, healthy adults who will be around to take care of us in the future. This is the human version. If the plant version doesn't work for you, um, these are some of my kids and some of their friends. Reframing, I like this sign. Please be safe. Do not stand, sit, climb, or lean on fences. If you do, you might fall in and the animals could eat you and that might make them sick. 
Thank you. So the reframing, reframing that messaging. So when we're talking to payers, when we're talking to, there was a question about how do we negotiate? When we're talking to payers, the right thing to do message that works so well for us doesn't really resonate. Sometimes it does, but typically it doesn't. So reframe using your data, what we learned this morning from Chip. So important, use your data, use that financial information so that you can prove your worth. But it's not just in our practice. As a group, we need to do that. And so AAP has established an agenda for payment transformation. So this work is critical because we need to be able to show that return on investment in dollars. When we're talking to people who have shareholders involved, who need to make profit, who have different initiatives and different things that they need to do, we need to show our financial value. I was excited. I was at a conference recently, recently with uh, leadership of one of the large payers, and the CEO was there, so national payer, and I brought this up. I said, you know, in pediatrics, it's a little bit different. We can't look at a 12-month return on investment. And you know what he said? He said, you're right. So what do we do? So do I have an answer to that? I have an answer, but we probably need a better answer. And we need one that's national. And so the AAP agenda for tra pavement transformation is looking very deeply at the academy level of being able to do this so that we have the answer. One of the things we do at AAP is we publish policy. We do that for our pediatric care, or clinical care and guidelines. But we also do that for the business of pediatrics. And so we just published a policy just in October on Medicaid and CHIP. It's important for what we have policy, and the reason for that is so AAP can advocate and can move forward with strategies so that when we go up to Congress and we talk to them that we have policy we can point to to say, this is best practice. So this policy statement is pretty transformational, a little bit visionary, in fact, and that's okay. There are also intermediary steps that we've put in there so that we can uh, have some steps today so that we can get to that future state. So one of the items was taking Medicaid and CHIP, which are two different programs in all the states uh, typically, and combining them to make that easier for all of us. Also enrolling everybody who's born in the United States automatically. So every newborn. But then when parents have other insurance, they can absolutely opt out. Because remember the unwinding issue? Right. For some families, this is super complicated. In fact, for most families, enrolling in Medicaid is super complicated. So let's not make that so hard. Our specialists are also struggling right now because, as we know, the payment issues for primary care. How many people are primary care in here? Most people. Anybody in specialty care? A couple. So our specialists are struggling because when you compare pediatric specialists to adult medicine specialists, there is an incredible differential. The types of procedures are so different. And as we know, we're in a procedure-based payment system. And so how do we encourage people who are graduating from programs in medical school and then in residency to consider going into pediatric subspecialties, especially those that are more cognitively based, like rheumatology, infectious disease? And so we at AAP partnered with the National Academy of Sciences of Engineering and Medicine to work on it. what can we do? What's the plan? And so this was recently published. And so we're excited to look at ways that we can help encourage people to go into pediatrics, first of all, and then pediatrics of specialty as well. Vaccines, we certainly, I just had a, a conversation with the folks from one of the vaccine um, manufacturers about what's been happening this year. And so we know there's been a lot. COVID vaccine went commercial. Nercivimab came and went. <laughs> Sorry, um, but it'll be back. So we do need to plan for next year. There are things that we need to do. And so I think understanding that at AAP, we've been working very hard on your behalf. So meeting with the CDC and ensuring that as we work with the CDC, we have new leadership there, Dr. Mandy Cohen, she's amazing. And she's very much engaged in pediatrics and understanding how we can improve healthcare for kids and how, what, do, what systems do we need to change in order to make sure that children are healthy. And the CDC works with AAP on all those things listed here. So it's not just vaccines, and it's not just disease prevention. We put out some information about nirsevimab, as you know. We will continue to do that as we go in planning for the next year. 
Um, I do appreciate my partners who are in the vaccine industry because they have been listening and they have been working with us really closely and I'm excited that we'll continue to have that close partnership going forward. For RSV, it's been in the area already, uh, but just so that you're aware, there is material available to your parents online at AAP. So if you're looking for clinical instructions, that's available. Who was at a a N NCE? I was here in DC this year. Yeah, so a few of you. So just real quick, quick words on NCE. I spent a lot of time talking about advocacy there. We'll continue to work on advocacy. DC is a wonderful place to be doing that work. Uh, we were able to give Dr. Fauci an honorary FAAP designation, which is the highest honor that AAP can bestow. That was very exciting. <laughs> Such an honor to be able to recognize the, the gentleman who took us through COVID, right, and helped to and combat misinformation and disinformation through science. My role in this was particularly fun. I was there to hold his award. <laughs> It was pretty fun though, because I had front row seats to everything he was saying, so it was very exciting. We also had the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra there, and he gave us some wonderful words. That's an advocate, he's an advocate for us. He is a child health um, believer and very much a promoter of child health, so it's really exciting when in their administration we have child health champions. We held a rally in DC. I think uh, some people in the audience were actually there, um, which was really fun. And we talked about putting kids first and the importance of all the things that we do. Um, we had we have two pediatricians in Congress this year, so Representative Kim Schreier and Representative Yadira Car Caraveo, and they both came and spoke, and that was super exciting. Mental health was another area we focused on this year, and so with 140 other organizations, we signed a letter to Congress saying how important it is that we focus on youth mental health. And advocacy works. You know, this is in a few of pictures just from my phone um, of areas where I was talking about mental health with various administration leaders, and then excited that it culminated with an announcement by President Biden that he was going to improve access to mental health and coverage by insurance companies. The PMHCA programs, this is DC map, VMAP, BHIP. We have these programs in our area, and then now they're all over the country. So that's really exciting to be able to see that. Some of the states that are not colored in blue also have programs that are just not funded by um, the HRSA administration. So. We also take care of all kids. Gender affirming care has been a big issue for us. And so throughout this country, you can see that in many states we have unfortunately seen legislation that restricts access to gender affirming care and that's a problem. That's a problem for children and it's a problem for families. It's a problem for those who care for them. And so at AAP, we continue to be very active in this role, participating in amicus briefs and, and legislation um, that supports gender affirming care. Reproductive health also has a similar map. So this is now talking about how our demographics in our country is changing. And so certainly in our area, we have a pretty diverse population. And so for the first time, you can see in that straight line um, that the uh, residents in the US under age 18 who identify as white is now below 50%. So that increased diversity across our country needs to be reflected in the healthcare that we provide in our practices. We have more and more children that are coming from immigrant families. I was talking to someone just earlier who also, who, whose family immigrated here to the US. Um, my family immigrated to the US. And so that immigration dynamic that's happening is significant. It's also uh, something we all need to be really um, careful about and pay attention to when we're thinking about the care that we deliver in our practices. Eliminating race-based medicine is something that AAP has been a leader on, and we will continue to work on that and implement going forward. Children who are crossing the border, are, uh, the number of unaccompanied minors is now on the increase coming across the border, and unfortunately, the situation that they're held in before they get, um, pro as they go through processing, is not always the healthiest and is not always run by people who know how to take care of children. And so as we, I've had the opportunity to visit them and I will be going back in January to, to visit. And really as AAP, we're invited 
constantly to give advice on how they can do better. The Department of Homeland Security and the Border Patrol uh, leadership, they're very much open to advice and they've just hired a pediatrician to help. So that's exciting. So, WIC. Does everyone know what WIC is? You know what WIC is, yeah. So WIC is a supplemental nutrition program. So I mentioned my parents immigrated to this country. When they came to this country, they were unable to get professional jobs. So my dad worked as a waiter in a restaurant. My mom sewed clothes in a factory. So I was born into poverty. And so I was on Medicaid. We lived in a, um, you know, I, we were on WIC. I remember at that time, you got really big blocks of cheese. I, I love cheese as a result of that, I think. But anyhow, they have more nutritious things now, including fruits and vegetables, so that's really exciting. Um, but kids who are on WIC, there are a lot of children in our country that need WIC, rely on WIC um, for their babies, uh, for the parents rely on it for their babies, pregnant moms rely on, rely on it for nutrition. WIC also provides significant education to families on how to, how to help their children develop and be healthy and helps to encourage prenatal visits. Breastfeeding rates have actually gone up 30% in the last several years because of WIC and WIC counseling for families. So WIC is incredibly important. But oh, WIC is in a troubled spot right now because as you all know about this continuing resolution where Congress passes funding for a few months typically and then they're just sort of kicking the can down the road until they look at establishing a formal budget WIC right now is going to run out of money if it's not refunded, but also it's going to have a shortfall even if it is. There are so many more people now because of the increase in poverty that now qualify for WIC that there's a $1 billion shortfall in WIC if there's not additional funding. So you may be hearing more opportunities for advocacy soon on how to ensure that Congress recognizes the fact that WIC needs more money in order for children to eat and babies to get formula or be breastfed and their moms to be healthy. I uh, mentioned gun violence prevention. So how many people have heard this story? Just don't wanna, yeah, not too many, all right. I told you my parents, when they immigrated to this country, my dad worked as a waiter, my mom so close in a factory. Eventually they saved up enough money and they opened up a Chinese restaurant. So they opened up a Chinese restaurant in Richmond, Virginia. So that's where I grew up. This is the restaurant. It wasn't in a particularly safe neighborhood. So there were um, several times where they were held up at gunpoint. In one of the windows, there was a bullet hole from a drive-by shooting. And my dad didn't bother to replace the window because he figured there would just be another shooting. So I knew my dad had a gun. That was just normal. He had it for protection. And so as an adult, I went back and brought my kids, and I have four kids, and this is Kevin. He was my oldest. He was 18 months at the time. All 18-month-olds should wear a tuxedo. Super cute. <laughs> That's a tuxedo for a three-year-old, so the sleeves are like super rolled up and the, you know, but anyhow. We were visiting my parents, brought Kevin along, and he was in the back of the restaurant where my parents kept their belongings. And so I had stepped away and I came back to see what he was doing. And I saw him, he was sitting on the floor and he was holding my father's gun and it was loaded. So what do you do? So I couldn't scream didn't want him to be startled. So I noticed that one of his toys was nearby. And I said, Kevin, look at what I have. And luckily, he dropped the gun, it did not go off, and he came over and got the toy. But that was a moment. That was a moment when I realized that I could be doing a better job in my own family in ensuring that guns were safe and stored appropriately. And that when we're in our practices, I mean, in my practice, I talk to families all the time in my long list of things I need to talk to them about, where I mentioned that if you have a gun, make sure that it's locked and safe and the ammunition is stored safe separately and locked, um, but never really thought to talk to my own family. And so I think as pediatricians, we need to recognize our role. I mean, we, I know we do, but really the importance of getting that message home and also to their, grand, to their grandparents and extended family members, wherever the child may be. So gun, there's Kevin now. So he's doing fine. 
So we do have our current administration who's supportive, and we'll see, you know, as our legislators go through their various iterations over the years, what will happen. But it's important as pediatricians that, and those of us who work in pediatric practices that we advocate for the safety of our kids. There is a special interest group, a firearm special interest group. So if this is something that interests you, it's a great place for us to share with each other what's working and what's not working. All right. So I'm going to shift a little bit, a little still AAP, but it's a little bit more of my IT hat. So protecting kids online. So pediatricians, we have had rules over the years, you know, limit your screen time. So dear American Academy of Pediatrics, why should kids only have one to two hours of screen time? And does this apply to eight-year-olds? I'm eight, right? I hope you have the answers to these questions. What I'm really impressed with is that this child heard us. Yeah, right? in your visits, when you're telling kids and you're talking, you're talking to the parent, you can believe those kids are listening. And so we've had to change what we've said over the years because screens are pervasive, right? There's no place now where you are, you know, I was walking through the lobby and up the elevator, and very commonly you'll just see people doing this, right? So people, we're on our devices a lot. And so our kids are growing up in this environment, and so it's important for us to think about as an academy what we need to do. AAP has established a center on social media and youth mental health. We were one of the first medical organizations to point out that social media may not be good for kids, and it may not be good for their mental health. And so this, this is online, and so it's got a portal where you can write in questions. Parents can write in, kids can write in, we can write in, and ask questions about what are their recommendations? What should we do to ensure that our children are safe when they're interacting on their devices? Um, how many people agree with these teenagers that they're being manipulated in social media? Yeah. Those of you who did not raise your hand, they're doing a really good job of manipulating you. <laughs> oh, they're not doing it. I'm doing this by myself. Um, but no, truly, I, I think what we need to understand is that there are algorithms, there are things actually that they do in order to make sure that we continue using their devices and their, their products. And it has a lot to do, it's very similar to the casino mentality. So if you've ever been in a casino, right, it's usually there's no windows. So you don't know what's happening. You don't know how long you've been, there are no clocks. So you don't know how long you've been sitting there. Um, a slot machine, for example, uh, it gives you the feeling that you are in power because you're pulling the thing. So you must be the one in charge or you're pushing the button, right? So these are psychological tools to make us feel like that we are doing whatever it is, right? We're in control. The social media companies are doing similar things. So with their algorithms, they're doing different psychological tools, they're using psychological tools in order to make sure that we stay attached. So fear of missing out, so endless scroll. So endless scroll is one where if you're looking at Facebook or Instagram, you know, you can just keep going, right? You know how you can just keep going and keep going. And the idea is that if you stop, there is a moment where your subconscious might be worried that you're gonna miss the next thing. If you miss that next thing, you might miss the most amazing whatever, and we got to just keep going. Or um, things like social proof. When you are buying something online, how many people look at the star ratings? I know I do. One note of warning, if it says 10,000 or 20,000 reviews in the positive, those probably aren't legitimate, right? But we believe it because we say, oh, another human thought this was awesome, so it must be awesome, I want it. Or it must be better than that other thing that only had four stars instead of five. So social proof, that's a psychological tool. Reciprocity, so if I like something, you should like me back, and vice versa when I post something. Scarcity, all of those things, you know, buy one now. Uh, Black Friday is a great example of this, Cyber Monday. That scarcity and time urgency, got to buy it now. So these are all things that we know are happening and where the algorithms are in place. So one of the challenges is that social media is not all bad, right? We use social media to engage with people who are like us. When we ask teenagers, why do you use social media and who are you talking to? 90% of them say they're just talking to their daytime friends like that they saw at school. Right, so they're talking to their real friends. 
I'm old enough to remember um, the phones that were attached to the wall that had a cord. And I remember taking that phone and going down, finding a seat somewhere on the stairs, you know, so I could stand there and talk or sit and talk for hours. Um, this is their version of that, right? So social media is not all bad, and especially for our kids from marginalized populations, social media can be incredibly helpful. But we also know their challenges, cyberbullying, body image dysmorphia, all of these things have been unfortunately worsened because of social media. And the algorithms are not all healthy, right? And so we do find that sometimes kids are being exposed to content that is harmful or that is not developmentally appropriate because of something they accidentally clicked on perhaps, or some of the videos that they may have been watching, they may be seeing content that's not appropriate for them. So what do we do? Well, something AAP does really well is advocacy. And so we go to Congress and we say, we need some rules. We need some rules, folks. And so we created, uh, worked with some sev several um, legislators, and now there are two pieces of legislation making their way through Congress to protect children's privacy online and to look at how we can manage social media vendors and help them design things that are safer for kids. So now we get to AI. How many people have used some form of AI? Okay, a lot of you. Chances are all of you have used some form of AI and you just may not know it. This is one step better than the phone attached to the wall. Anybody remember using these? I'm just curious. Yeah. I went into a, I went, has anyone done an escape room? Before COVID, yeah. <laughs> so so we, my family, we love puzzles. So we went to an escape room. And one of the puzzles required that you dial a number on this. <laughs> I have four teenagers. That was hilarious. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they were like sticking their fingers in the hole and trying to make things happen. Then they were, they got like one of the numbers and they're like, oh, it wiggles. So they would shake it. And, <laughs> And then they hoped it would happen. And they didn't know to pick it up, so they had that part down, but uh, one of them did hold it upside down, but you know, but it was funny. So just, you know, it's, it's weird to think about, right? You have to stick your finger in the hole, pull it all the way over to the lever, and then wait as it goes back. And then do it again. Right? Super slow, super slow. But that's how we did it. So this isn't as modern, but here we are. Right? And so the phone is not really, I mean, phone calls are sort of a secondary thing now that we use our phones for. One thing that we do in healthcare, though, when there's new technology, we don't tend to adopt brand new technology very fast. There are reasons for that, but we're a really pretty slow industry when it comes to adopting technology. So what we tend to do is create things like this. So we try to use the new technology, but we want our old thing. So EMRs are a great example of this, where we took our paper charts and we replicated them on a screen, right? And, and that's not necessarily the best way to do that. So there are things we need to worry about in AI, but there are some good things coming too. So I'm gonna just do an overview of AI. There's a lot to talk about, as you can imagine, it's changing minute by minute practically. And so with AI and children, I just wanted to point out a few things that we need to be thinking about for those of us who work in the pediatric space. So that little egg-shaped device in front of the girl, that's a device that records a few minutes of a parent talking or a caregiver talking, and then it can speak in that person's voice. It can tell stories in that person's voice. And so one can imagine that this young girl, who maybe is around seven or so, eight, maybe a little bit older, um, will imagine her parent speaking out of this device. And then once you start imagining that, you start to have feelings, right? You start to have emotions towards a thing. That's really the important piece to note about AI. So in social media, the idea is to keep your attention, right? Keep your attention attached to the device. So the way the vendors make money is by keeping you attached longer. And so it's the attention economy. So you make money by capturing someone's attention. In AI, it's called the relationship economy. So the way that you capture someone's time and money is by capturing their relationship. Now, all of us have smart devices, probably, in some form or fashion, maybe not everybody, but a lot of us. 
So I don't, I want, don't, don't want to say their names out loud because I don't want to trigger your devices. Um, but you know, if you have something and you say, hey, whatever, tell me the weather, right? And they don't get it right, like they misunderstood you, what do you typically do? Say it again, right? And then if they still don't get it right, then what do you do? You might say it louder, you might get kind of mad, you might just say, forget it, go find another device to talk to, you know, whatever. Well, you just had feelings to our thing, right? You just had feelings to an AI, to an inanimate object. You just had a feeling. So we've already experienced this. So just imagine that more and more. And that's what's coming, or already is here somewhat, but um, when we have kids, though, who are still magical thinkers, the school-age kids are magical thinkers, or infants and toddlers who have no idea that these things are not real, or you have teenagers who are so susceptible to peers, if they believe this AI is their peer, then there's a concern, right? And the concern changes based on age of development. So as pediatricians, we know that, and it's really important that we be at the forefront of advocacy in this space. It's not all bad. There are some really innovative ways that AI is being used. Have already heard of Khan Academy? Khan Academy, yeah. So Khan Academy has developed um, an AI tool to help teach, which is pretty amazing. Doesn't give you the answers, but what it does is it learns how you learn, and it learns how you learn and what you're interested in. So imagine if everywhere in the world, every child could have a tutor a tutor who knows them, and a tutor who can teach based on what they know. That's pretty exciting, as long as the tutor's not biased, and the tutor has all the right information, and the tutor understands the context and where they're located and what's going on in their family and in their culture. So there's a lot there. You can use AI to help, um, so you can see the vision impaired um, partnership there where their AI can look at things for you if you're vision impaired, and so it's worked. Really interesting thing. Character AI. So I'll be talking about some vendors' devices, not endorsing anybody. I'm just using them for as examples. But character AI is a text-based one. So you can go on there and you can text with any of the characters they have there. So they have historical characters, they have famous people, and you can have text conversations with them. So I just did one. So this was with Einstein, and I asked him, you know, how did you come up with E equals MC squared? And he came up with an answer, and he told me what was going on. A friend of mine had a seven-year-old who did this um, with another character. And at the end, oh, it wasn't seven years, sorry, an 11-year-old. So an 11-year-old who did this with a famous character. And at the end, she thanked the character for spending time with her. So again, we start thinking about these as, as real people. They can make pictures, they can draw images amazingly well. So the prompt at the bottom is what you put in when you're talking to an AI to get them to do stuff. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So anything, anybody see anything wrong with the doggy? He's got six legs, <laughs> right? So they're still working on it. <laughs> but this doesn't always happen. This is called an, a hallucination. So when an AI does something wrong, it's called a hallucination. So just so that you have the, the words. The other one I did, where I put in these words, this is a picture, not, they didn't, AIs don't go out to the internet to find a picture, like Google does, you know, and the search engines. They're going out looking at the real internet and finding things that match your search and bringing them forward. What AI does is it actually creates it from scratch. So when I put these words in, this is the picture that it created from scratch. So that is super interesting. So I went and Stable Diffusion's one that generates images. This is free, it's fun to play with. So I put in all these words. Super cute bird, rendered in the style of a Pixar cartoon, full body, shiny and fluffy, bright big eyes, fluffy tail, et cetera, et cetera. Took less than a minute, really, about a minute. And this is what it gave me. So cute. So, but imagine if you're in an industry where it's your job to make those things. And when less than a minute, anybody, anybody can make these now. Same thing for videos, music, text-based products. 
Can anyone point out the real child here? Yes? Who thinks the real child's on the top row? Okay. How about the middle row? How about the bottom row? None of these are real children. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's scary. Yeah, none of those are real children. So when we think about what AI can do, it can sort of blow your mind a little bit, it can be scary a little bit. But if you think about the fact that industries where you need real people to pose for things, pictures, and even for your own practices, right? How can you use this kind of, um, excuse me, technology? You know, if you're doing marketing for your practice, you don't, you could create a lot of things on your own now, maybe, that you don't need a, um, a professional to do. Um, sounds. So sounds is another place where AI can make quite a bit of change. Um, I'm not going to play this, but this is Brad Pitt giving a real speech. And what the person did is that what the program, the AI did, is you could type in who you want Brad Pitt to sound like, and that person would give Brad Pitt's speech in their words, so in their voice, all of those things. So. I went ahead and I went to an AI site that creates sounds, and I said, gosh, I want to have a pediatrician, a woman pediatrician, talk about the AAP. And I typed in the words I wanted her to say, and this is what she said. You know what? I think the American Academy of Pediatrics is the most wonderful organization in the world. It is the best advocate for child health and pediatricians. And when I see all the things happening in the world, I am so glad that as a mentor, I have a chance to help protect children in my family. So that's not a real person. That's an AI. Took a second to make, maybe two. Then I said, instead, make it a middle-aged man. You know what? I think the American Academy of Pediatrics is the most wonderful organization in the world. It is the best advocate for child health and pediatrician. And when I see all the things happening in the world, I am so glad that as a member, I have a chance to help protect children and their families. Pretty amazing, yeah. So if you need to create a podcast, you need to record something, you need all of those things, you know, you can create all of that. The other day I called my cell phone company. I was sure it was an AI. I got really mad, because I'm like, I don't want to talk to a machine. But it sounded just like a person. Um, but I think part of what we'll be learning as we go forward is how to recognize when someone's an AI and when someone's not. One of the things that's really challenging here is figuring out what's real and not real. We were just talking about with kids, how hard that's going to be for ourselves. It's going to be challenging too. You can I hope you understand that there are enough people concerned that there are groups of AI developers that are trying to figure out how do we keep this safe? You know, how do we recognize when AI is being used, not being used? I can almost guarantee you that those groups don't have a pediatrician sitting at the table. So there is a lot of work we need to be doing. Um, oops. Um, these avatars, so those people, they are not real people, so we saw that. Um, and you can also have real people and get them to do stuff. So for example, uh, you have Morgan Freeman talk, give a commercial for your practice. So um, who's heard of deep fakes? Yeah, so deep fakes are the things that we worry about, misinformation, disinformation coming from not real people, not real things. Um, so a lot of work happening, but I just wanted to expose you to some of this so that you have some idea of what's actually happening in the industry. Large language models, this is probably what most of you may have worked with. Who's worked with like ChatGPT, BARD, some of this, yeah. So ChatGPT is probably one of those most known on the internet, um, but there are several, Windows has, I mean, um, Microsoft has one, um, and there's a group called Anthropic that has one. There's several out there. And these are word-based ones. So 
AI can do several things, and WINS is, uh, this is not just large language models, but WINS is a, an acronym that I like that, to describe what AI can attack or do. And so words, images, numbers, and sounds. Like it can write code, it can write programming code, it can um, do all those things I already showed you. And it can write things, it can write a lot of things, it can summarize text. Um, and so large language models are trained on big databases. So the way these things learn, the way that they get their information is, for, for example, OpenAI, which is a company that created ChatGPT, took all of the internet up to a certain year, everything they could glean from the internet, and they fed it into ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is getting information from looking at patterns so it's not a search engine. It's not going through and trying to find the document that was created by somebody else human. It's looking at patterns of words. So if I go once upon a, what's the next word? Then what's the next word? There you go. And why did you know that? Repetition patterns, something you've heard your entire life over and over again. That's basically what large language models are doing. They're looking at patterns of words. So based on what you type in and what you say, it's anticipating what the next word is. And it does that for every single word going forward. So when it's answering you, if you type something in and it answers you or it does something for you, it's taking it from patterns of all the things in its database that it saw. What makes each AI different is they're being trained on different databases. And the bigger the database, the better it might be. The smaller the database, the more challenging it might be, or the realer it might be. Like if it's medical AI and it's being trained on uh, AAP and the Red Book and all the things that we read and that we believe in and that we know is evidence-based, you can believe that AI more than you can believe perhaps ChatGBT because we know the database was trained on materials that were uh, legitimate, if you will. There's also a new challenge happening where some of the big companies like Reuters and um, CNN, I think, or BBS, some of the people are saying the companies where their stuff is being used in these large language models are complaining. They're like, we didn't give you permission to do that. We're taking it out. We want it back. But if you take out all of the things that are real, what are you left with? Right, the misinformation and disinformation. But what can you use this stuff for? I've done a lot of things to kind of slightly terrify you, but, um, <laughs> but there are a lot of good things that this can be used for. So a prompt. So remember all those words that I showed you that I put in to create those images? Those are called prompts, and that's what you put in. So when, similar to what you might put into a search engine, we've all learned the words to type into a search engine to get what we want. So now it's learning how to do prompts. And, they're actually, and prompts are longer, as you've seen. And so there are these things, people who do this for a living now, they're called prompt engineers. And so prompts, so a prompt is a set of instructions. Do you remember English essay prompts? Like the teacher would give you something and then you had to write an essay underneath. Yeah, so that's a prompt for you. So a prompt for an AI um, is instructions, essentially, say what you want. So I did one, I said, as a pediatrician, write a letter to school explaining why a patient needs to be homebound due to POTS. And then a second later, it gave me this letter. So I'm writing to formally request homebound education services for my patient, and this patient was diagnosed with severe postural, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, et cetera. And then it provides a pretty good explanation. It provides full sentences. It provides the context, the, the framework for the letter. Anybody used something like this to do that? Yeah. It's a really useful tool. It's a really useful tool to save time. But what you need to do is edit it and make sure it's right, because don't assume it's right. One of the useful things that I learned is when you're writing up the prompt, you might want to put something in there and use aap.org or use facts or don't lie. Like, like literally, right, and don't lie, you know, or don't make up stuff, don't hallucinate. It's, you're instructing something that doesn't know any different, right? So give it all the rules. But you can, if you think about writing an appeals letter to an insurance company, 
right? If you think about um, somebody, well, you got to write re uh, request records from somebody, you know. So there are places you think about things you do every day that take up time that are straightforward, but or take up time. These can be really useful. AI is not new; it's been around a long time, um, and so I think understanding that the work that when you're interacting with the world, there's probably an AI behind a lot of what you do um, that you may not realize. It's in medical devices already, you know, so um, in pathology, when we look at smears, and do you think that a person's counting all the hemoglobin or all the platelets? Not typically. There's AI behind some of that. Right, so, so AI is a very big word for a lot of things, but we've been using AI uh, for quite some time. Um, robotic surgery is another place, augmented uh, intelligence. Some people have said they don't want to call it artificial intelligence, they want to call it augmented intelligence. Artificial intelligence is more common probably, but there is a movement to say, we're not replacing doctors, we're helping them, which is true. Uh, one, of the, one of our strategic priorities was safety, is safety and well-being of the pediatric profession. The same Medscape, they do a survey of happiness. And so this was before the pandemic, and you can see pediatricians were number two. I don't know what the pulmonologists are doing, but <laughs> they're pretty happy. Um, so that was before the pandemic. And here we are after the pandemic. So things have changed. There's a lot going on, right? A lot of things we've been tackling. And it's not about making us stronger. We've all heard about how we should all be stronger, how we should meditate, how we do yoga, journal, all of the things to help ourselves. Um, but it's really this, right? And when I say health systems, your practice is a system. So how do we create work environments where we're supported and that all of us can do our work and be well at the same time? And so, how can AI be useful? So every EMR vendor, I believe, is now looking at AI or has already started that work. There are some pretty interesting things. I don't know, when you guys were listening to Jan's talk about the ICD-9 codes or 10 codes, anybody get it? it was like, oh my gosh. I'm writing my note through codes, right? If I needed to identify that a child had a ingested a blue rubber band on Thursday, you know, with the code, you know, all of the things that they're asking us to do now. But imagine with AI could read your note or listen to the visit and figure that out for you. And elevate to you three codes that might be the right ones. And you got to just choose it. All right? That would save time. What if I could write your note? So just FYI, AI can write your note now. We're just waiting for adoption and we're waiting for integration into all the different EMRs. And then there are privacy questions about all of that too, right? So there's some things to work out before this is rolled out on a large scale. But if your device can understand what you're saying when you talk to your watch or you talk to your smart home device, there's no reason why an AI can't engage with a visit and hear and understand when you guys are just talking about the weather or your child's sports, that that's not the clinical part of the visit. So there's a lot of interesting things coming down the pike. This is a very long list, and I'm not, I don't have time to go through all of them, but I just wanted to point out a few of them. So the ones in blue are sort of related to operations as far as, uh, I'm sorry, towards the patients. So how might patients engage in AI in order to um, take better care of themselves and their children? So having virtual assistants, having access 24-7 to a health chat bot, which might be able to triage. Wearable devices, you know, one thing about wearable devices is as clinicians, we don't want all that data, right? It's too much for us to look at, but if an AI could look at it first and then tell us what was important to look at, that might be helpful. Education, personalizing education again. You can, AI is amazing at translating, so if you took the Red Book or something, or, and fed it into the AI and said you wanted it in Chinese, it could do it, you know? So there are things, if you are able, education, taking our, our patient handouts and putting them in a place so that an AI could give it to a family in a way that they could understand it. That's an amazing use of AI. 
The yellow things are really back office related. So billing and coding, I was just talking about a possible coding use. Figuring out denials. You can bet, oh, I know this already. So the insurance companies have already adopted AI to deny claims. So they are already using it to, to say this isn't okay. Now remember, it's an AI that did it. So sometimes things are gonna slip. And so make sure you appeal all those claims. And maybe your AI can talk to their AI and they can just have a conversation and you can just go drink a cup of coffee or something, right? But, but I think that that is, well, I know that's also a place where we're gonna be using AI. Um, marketing, you know, create, you can create amazing marketing tools now on your own. Um, appointment scheduling reminders and AI would know when somebody's birthday was and when they were due for a well visit because it could look in your EHR and see when their last well check was and send that reminder. Right? As opposed to the more generic ones we might be doing now where it's the birthday reminder or, or just an annual one. And then the clinical pieces, a lot to be done there that could be possible where it could help us with clinical decision support making. So understanding you know, who's due for a vaccine. It could look at rashes for us and then elevate some diagnoses, potential diagnoses. So as think about, there are a lot of tools that are coming our way. And so, so that was a lot. So I did go through and asked a couple of AI friends what they thought about using AI in clinical pediatrics. And these were their answers. So ChatGPT said, it's essential to note while that AI can bring numerous benefits, its integration into pediatric medical practices should be done with careful consideration of ethical privacy and security concerns, especially when dealing with sensitive health information of children. Um, and then Claude, Claude I like, Claude also has a lot of questions and doesn't seem to know as much, but Claude's pretty nice. Um, but he said, the key overall benefit to using AI is to enhance pediatricians' capabilities to provide timely, high-quality, personalized care for our children. AI allows them to focus on the human elements of care. Bard from Microsoft, um, again, talks about the ethical considerations and responsible development and that bias is an issue, transparency is a key, um, and so forth. And then Bing wanted to know that AI is not a replace for human doctors. Um, or pedi pediatricians. I want to know. I don't know why we're not also human doctors, but <laughs> I'm an AI. No, um, but indeed. So, so you know, everybody's got an opinion. So, anyhow, I just thought that was helpful. Just if you believe the AI, they they have their programmers have put in some caveats related to healthcare. So we are pediatricians, we are human doctors, um, and so something we are doing at AAP is reminding us why we do what we do and why we went into this field. And this is not just for us, but it's also for the public so that everyone um, remembers why we're here. And I just wanted to share one with you real quick. My, my name is Dr. Fitchers, and I'm a science doctor, and so I have been <laughs> we know why we're in pediatrics so I just wanted to leave you with this message you know may your laughter be contagious and may your life be filled with hope and positivity and a zest, unwavering zest for living um, together let's light up the world with our smiles and our laughter thank you so much <laughs>